and I had a 400 credit score before I made a dollar in real estate. I knew how to spend money, great. You want me to, you want, you want to go to Home Depot? You want to see me pay for contractors? I'll spend it. But did I make a dollar? Not one dollar, and I was wrecked. Dang. Okay? You sound like Brent Daniels. Uh, he, he, was, he was one of my guys. So I was absolutely wrecked. I was broke. It was now two, oh, dead broke. This was 2009. You can't do real estate. You can't do mortgages. But everybody has these mortgages that are about ready to explode. So what was the next step? Loan modifications. So the only thing that kept food on my table for about a year was collecting money trying to do loan modifications. And then load modifications went into short sales. And then short sales, then it was like 2010, and I was explaining to somebody else, I, okay, so it was 2010, I'm dead broke. I go to the Dave uh, Real Estate Investors Association with David Dinkle, and I walk in, and I'm, I'm the hard money lender who has all the money in the world, all I wanna do is lend out money. I figured, fake it till you make it. I have nothing to offer, but if I can create some kind of contacts and I can create relationships, then something's gonna come from it. So at that meeting, I bump into a Haitian realtor. He, was, he heard me talking about hard money and he's, he, unfortunately, that, at that time in 2009, 2010, there was a lot of shady stuff going on. There was straw buyers. Anybody here know what a straw buyer is? No. So what happens is, Realtors at that time were taking advantage of people and getting them to buy houses, sign. It was, it was an absolute mess. So I got involved with a Haitian realtor who I basically can thank the Haitian community for my rebounding in life. So any Haitians out here? Great people, great people. So I get, I'll go back another step. So after I got involved with the Haitian community, I was actually on Haitian radio for three years. I was on Haitian radio, my guy, his name is Herbie Dorval, he would be the, he would speak in Creole and I would be speaking English, but we were on the radio. That was my only form of marketing for like three years, being on the radio. Because Haitians, you know, they love the radio. Yeah. They, they don't really love to watch TV, they don't, they don't read the newspapers, but the radio is, is that's where it began. So we, that's how we were able to rebuild. Um, I had met the one Haitian guy, and then it went to, a, then I met another guy, and then I settled with the guy who actually, he and I got together. So I was a million in the hole, he was five million in the hole. You think people need each other? <laughs> so I was the mortgage broker at that time, he was the realtor, we would get on the radio, we would bring in buyers, and we would get buyers qualified. So now we have some qualified buyers, but now we need houses. So one thing led to another, we go on the MLS, we're trying to find houses. And you know, it, you, you talk about those vibes and the vibrations, somehow I found a guy on the MLS who had been in, who had gone to, who had known my younger sister since the sixth grade and he was trying to sell a house. So we meet up and one thing leads to another and that's 12 years later and we're still doing business together. So the, the, what we did, the dynamic that we built was I would get the, the listings for my guy, he would bring the buyers for me. You know, when, when you're a partnership sometimes, you don't need to, um, you don't need to take money from each other. You know, it's, it's a, an abundance mindset, it's not a scarcity. Mm -hmm. So he didn't put his hand in my pocket, I didn't put my hand in his pocket, I tried to bring business to him, he brought it to me, and we figured, listen, we're both in bad shape, but if two guys in bad shape who have their minds set can come together, then let's just make it happen. So. One thing led to another, we started getting, we got our buyers in, um, we were able to get leads, I was able to develop with uh, the guy who I had met on the MLS, give us listings, I would give the listings to him. One thing leads to another, we're scrapping some, some commissions together, one, one, you know, we do some closings, so at that point we're able to see, you know, we're, I mean, houses in North Miami at that time we were paying forty to fifty thousand dollars. These houses right now are four hundred thousand. So we were. We, if my credit was a four hundred, his was worse. 
So, yeah, so, so at that point, we needed somebody to help us out. You always, need, you always need somebody to give you that hand. So we decide, we found a guy. I remember my first property that I was able to buy after my disaster, we paid a tent, we paid a five, we paid five percent, five points up front, 15% interest, and a 10% kicker when we sold the property. Okay? Is that legal? It, it was usury, but you know what? It was the best usury I ever saw because it, was, it got me back in, uh, in business. So we did one deal, we did two deals, we're doing, we're little by little, little by little, we're, so we were still listing properties, but what we were doing was we were developing the buyers to sell our properties to them because it's one thing to get a 3% commission, it's another thing at that point to get a thirty to $40,000 um, exit on your flip. So, wait, let me see where I'm at right here. Okay. Okay, so I was explaining all my, my marketing, the only thing I did was go on the Haitian radio. So, for um, up until 2018, all I did was market for REO Realtors. So does anybody here know what an REO is? It's real estate owned by the bank. So as they were creating all these um, foreclosures, they would take the properties back and these realtors would sell the properties. You don't see too many REOs right now or you haven't seen them in the last two, three years, but believe me, there's gonna be some REOs that are coming back on, uh, online. So we were able to just do word of mouth. You know, I was on the, on the MLS finding REO realtors and the key at that point was a, a realtor was gonna deal with you if they can maximize their commission. So my theory was call these guys, let them know we, own, we have a real estate license, but we want you to get both sides of the commission. Always, if you're gonna buy property from a realtor on the MLS, offer them both sides of the commission. Because you're try, if, if any realtor in here is trying to purchase and they think that that 3% is gonna make a difference to them, you wanna make 3% of a hundred, let's, let's call it a $200,000 purchase. You wanna make 3%, which is six grand, or do you want the opportunity to buy a house that you could make 50,000? So that was a tactic that we were using in order to find property. So I didn't, do, I didn't spend a dollar up until 2018. 2018, I said, you know, this business is getting tough. There, there's not a lot of properties. I need to venture out and I need to figure how to go direct to seller. So in 2018, I went to this conference in Asheville, North Carolina, where I met Brent Daniels and I met Todd Toback and I got signed up with his Next Level Wholesaling, that was Todd Toback, and then Brent Daniels, TTP, and figured out that we were gonna go direct to, uh, direct to seller at that time. I have many moons, I have many lives, so let me explain this. Who here is doing it on their own and who here has a partner? I'm doing it on my own. Who here has partners? Just be careful, you know, you don't, you got to realize who you're working with and each one of you have to complement each other. I had a best friend of mine, uh, another best friend, who we got involved together. We were both basically in the same role and there, it just didn't, it, it didn't work out. So you have to realize who you're getting involved with. You, you guys have to complement and add value to each other. If two people are gonna trip over each other trying to do the same role, it's, it's not gonna work out. So I almost lost my best friend for life over trying to do wholesaling. So, but we were able to regroup and two years later, uh, everything was fine. But so 2018, we say, okay, we're going direct to wholesale. But we're going direct to seller. We start doing, we think, we want to do everything. We want to do direct mail. We want to do PPC. We want to do cold calling. The one bit of advice that I, got, that I can give you guys is when you're starting, you don't need to spread yourself so thin. You need to figure out one lane, get that lane down, and then add. If you're going to jump, you're going to be, a, uh, it's, it's just not going to work because you're not going to get the traction. So I realized this and I said to myself, okay, we're jumping all around. Cold calling is, it's something that I know that we can make this work. So let's just concentrate for once. 
This was after I had broken up from my partner. Let's just concentrate and go the route of cold calling. So I did the TTP, and the one thing that he was promoting in his, um, in his class was, you need to do this with American callers under your own roof. So I listened to my mentor, and I got a place in North Miami. I built out a call center. He says, oh, and you need to pay everybody $20 an hour, because they're not going to be motivated if not. Yes. So I put six people in a room, paying them $20 an hour. Me learning the system at the time, not realizing I was no pro in cold calling. I was just bringing in. So doesn't work, guys. The way, listen, you got to be conservative because if you just think that you can throw money at marketing, it doesn't work. Marketing works if you understand how it works. So after I probably burned through like 50K, uh, this was in 2019, I said, oh, there's got to be a better way. So thankfully, through Brent Daniels Group, I found a company that was doing outsource um, cold calling in the Philippines. So I said, okay, I can't afford, I, I can't burn through this money anymore. I got, I got to get some, uh, some regularity with what we're doing. Let's try and figure out the whole Filipino side. So we hired three people. One of the girls who was in of my cold caller, she was she worked for HSBC. She, I mean, this was somebody who she was a dream employee in the United States, and she happened to live in the Philippines. So we're working, we're working, and then I said, okay, you know what? She said to me, she says, I can't live on this salary that that I'm being paid. Is there any way we can we can move forward? So I said, the only way we could move forward is if you become everything over there. You have to be the trainer, you have to be the recruiter, you have to be, you have to be able to bring people into the fold for us to be able to thrive. So that was in 2019. Now we're 2022. She's my, her name is Clarice. She's my right hand woman. She runs a team of 14 people that I have in the Philippines working for me right now. Um, she handles all of the, she's, she's the cold call trainer. She's the property, she works in property management. She works in every facet of the business. I would be lost if I didn't have her with me, lost. So we have 14 people there of which we have seven cold callers. I have three people texting. Uh, so after I realized that I needed to get cold calling down, we got cold calling down. And then Brent Daniels was pushing Sherpa, lead Sherpa. I was one of their beta um, customers. So right now we're sending out about 10,000 text messages a day from the Philippines. And we have seven cold callers. And then I have an IT guy over there, and I have my girl Clarice, and then we have an admin and a property manager. Can I ask you something? Yeah. I want to interrupt you. Yeah. How much are you paying them, and how are you doing with the texting? Are you getting any conversions? Yes, I'm getting conversions. How much conversions. are you paying these people to start? I'm paying them $5 an hour. Okay. And Clarice makes more than that. Clarice makes seven, oh, man, that's awesome. plus $100 for every closed deal. Wow. I pay my 200 for closed deal, and my, my rock star makes seven. Right. Right, so yeah, she gets seven so plus. So with the text, 10,000 a day? 10,000 I mean, a day. You're, what's that called, where you have to register your EIN? Yes, yeah, yeah, totally. I forgot what it's called. Um, I mean, it's Stern. 10, 10, 10 DLC, 10 yeah. DLC. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then it's Stern and Shaken is what the new regulations yeah. were. We're using uh, Zencall for our cold calling. You are? Yeah. yeah have you tried call tools? I, I was with call tools. We got out of call tools. Why? It just, it wasn't, it wasn't user friendly. We started, when I started with Brent Daniels, we did Mojo for like the first two months, didn't like Mojo, jumped to call, call tools. We had, I thought we were doing great with call tools, but then once we switched to Zen Call, it just, everything was better for us. And texting you Sherpa? Texting, we use Sherpa. So I started with Sherpa, then Sherpa, okay, so there's a whole thing going on with texting. So these systems use Twilio. Do you know what? Yeah, I use right. Twilio for my texting. Right, so Twilio, we got like blacklisted with Twilio. So it was, it became a mess for us. So we went from Sherpa to Launch Control. Launch Control hated. Launch Control. 
hated launch control. Oh. Could, didn't, did, just didn't work for us. So why did you hate it? Because it was, we, I needed two people just to be able to create uh, outbound sequences. Like you had to continuously change. You change the script. Oh, right. You get flagged by the carrier. Right, right. But especially, it wasn't even getting flagged by the carriers, it was launch control doing the flagging. They would like, they, really? yeah, it was a mess. So we were with launch control for a few months. Then I went to batch and that's when batch was pure Twilio based and we had an issue with Twilio. Um, and so then in January of this year, I had a lawsuit through texting. Yes. How much I, was that for? It co my, the attorney cost me 15 and, my, and I had to pay 15 to the litigator. So it cost me 30K. So at that point, I'm like, okay, I gotta stop texting. Oof. But it cost me more stopping texting than paying the 30 and just figuring it was a marketing cost. Yeah. But I didn't learn, I didn't realize that. Unfortunately, you know, hindsight is 2020. And when you're in it, you think, oh, I got, I got, I got flagged. This could happen again. And I said, no, let's not. But then, unfortunately, the our lead flow. It wasn't that texting was so incredible, okay? But when we were calling and texting at the same time, same you're person. getting people from different air, from different uh, directions, and it just it becomes better. Yeah. What do you do with all those leads? How many lead managers you got? No, I we actually have. We only have one lead manager. Wow, with all those leads? Yeah. I had five cold calls and I was getting like 20 leads a day. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah we're, we, so on our cold calling scripts, we try and, and get it much more. You're you pre qualifying. Know, yeah, we're pre qualifying. We don't want anybody who just raises their hand. Because in cold calling, like he just said, it's so important. If, you're, if your um, criteria is too loose, you can get more leads then you know what to do with. And all these leads do is create work. You don't want to create work, you want to create conversions. So that's why with Clarice, we ended up getting our criteria, tightening it up and tightening it up in order to get better leads in. Because just the follow-up alone, you'll burn thousands of dollars a month just in follow-up. So use the four pillars. You have to. Condition, right. timeline, motivation, yeah. and price. Yeah. Um, the one of the most the, the key to this business, you know, Rich and I we were talking about it, it's follow up. You guys have to realize that if you think that you're going to make a, a deal by calling somebody once, you're in the wrong business. You need to follow up, follow up, and then when you're done following up, follow up more because some of your best deals are going, you know, you could meet somebody now and you could create rapport with this person, but that deal might not happen for six to eight months because you might not have found them at the right time in their lives where they wanted to sell. They don't need to sell right now, but if you create the rapport, you know, Rich was saying, he's not worried about another wholesaler coming in and stealing his deals because the rapport that he's building is more important than anything else. So that's what we always are preaching, just rapport. Abundance mindset. Yeah. Abundance. Yeah, and it's just creating that rapport, understanding when you're talking to these sellers that they aren't just a number, they're a person, and the more you pour into them, the better of an opportunity you're gonna have in doing business with them in the future. So, um, so May of last year, I was involved in a mastermind group. Anybody here know what masterminds are? Yeah. Right, so you know, it's investors uh, from around the country, everybody comes together and it's that abundance mindset where you pour in and everybody discusses what's working for them, what's not working for them, and it's like a collective, uh, it's a collective gathering of what's good and what isn't good. So I was at a uh, mastermind in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and I met a guy from Memphis, Tennessee, and he says to me, he's like, why are you buying rentals in South Florida? I'm like, that's where I live. He's like, come buy them in Memphis. So, after leaving the, the mastermind, I told Clarice, all right, let's get some leads in Memphis. Boom, 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 boom. One thing leads to another. And from, I left the, the, I left the mastermind in May of last year, and then through today, I have 70 rentals in Memphis. Wow. 70. 
So what's the, the median price point over there? The mean, so that's another thing. I kind of got in at the right time. You know, things have, have escalated up, but I would say anywhere between forty to $70,000 and the rents are anywhere, my lowest rents are 850 up to 1500. The three twos or the two ones? The, the two, I have like, I, so that's another thing. When I bought my rentals, here, what? No, please, please. Okay, I tried not to buy two ones. I wanted to buy three ones yeah. because a, another thing is, is that we wanted to go section eight. And in the future, the three one is gonna be more important than the two one. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I have, a, I have, I bought 16 townhouses in a, um, in a townhouse community, and those rent from 1250 to 1500. And they have HOAs over there? Yeah, they have HOAs, yeah. No restrictions? I mean, the res just the restriction is you gotta pay the HOA. <laughs> <laughs> I mean rent restrictions. No, 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 no. And that's the other thing, in Memphis, everything here in South Florida, you know, you have code enforcement behind you, you have, e in Memphis, they're sitting there hoping that you're going to invest in their community. So, I mean, we've rebuilt properties with no, I, I, the only permits I've ever pulled in Memphis were for uh, electricity, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. How do you manage that many rentals? Okay, so I have a guy on the ground who's like my property manager, and then my team in the Philippines, we have, uh, I have two girls, and we manage from the Philippines. So we have a, a, pro a system called Buildium, which is incredible, and it's just uh, constant communication. It's the rapport, it's just always being in contact with them, and having the guy on the ground is paramount. If you're not on the ground, then, you, you know, you gotta you got have somebody who they're accountable for, who they can come to the house and say, okay, you didn't